I've heard people teach and talk about the, the, the Gog and Magog mystery that we read of, prophecy that we read of in Ezekiel uh, 38 is, you know, it's the table is set. It's about to happen. It could happen now. You know, Israel has been regathered and uh, the stage is set for that prophecy. <clears throat> but I think we may find a little bit different than that. Let's just turn to Ezekiel 38 to start off with. Read the prophecy and see what we can make of it. Ezekiel 38, we'll start in the second verse. And uh, it says, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army. And, uh, of course, he does have a, a large group with, with him. Uh, and I think most of us recognize that when he's talking about Gog, it's speaking of the, the Russian people, the Scythian people. But we know them as Russians. And some of their allies that would be coming with them will be Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Kush, which is Ethiopia, and maybe Sudan as well, and Put, which I think most people understand to be Libya. And also it mentions Gomer and Beth Togomar. Gomer, I think, is understood to be Germany by some. I'm not so sure. And uh, Beth Togomar is Turkey. So it'll be a, a great uh, group of people, of nations, that will uh, come out against, uh, against Israel. <clears throat> says, verse 8, after many days you will be called to arms. In future years you will invade a land that was recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountain of Israel, which has long been desolate. You and your troops with many nations will go up, advancing like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. <clears throat> and in verse 10, it says, this is what the sovereign Lord says on that day. Thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme. So we should keep that in mind. These thoughts, what's the source of them? An evil scheme might give us some, some clue as to what the source of those thoughts are. You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I underline that too, unwalled. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. So when I read this and I start comparing it to modern Israel, I begin to have a little bit of problems. Uh, an unsuspecting people, peaceful and unsuspecting, don't really think so. I, I, I don't know of any nation in the world that's more vigilant than modern Israel, under more attacks. In fact, they're, they're neighbors and many they are not their neighbors pledge to destroy them completely and there's probably not a week goes by that they don't come under attack one way or the other from rockets or terrorist attacks so I don't see modern Israel as we see it now as being unsuspecting peaceful and certainly not unwalled villages they uh, just had to build a wall to protect themselves against terrorists in uh, the West Bank and of course in the south they heavily fortified against uh, Gaza. And in the north, they're again heavily fortified their border with, uh, with Lebanon. And of course, the northeast, the Golan Heights, is fortified against uh, Syria. So that really doesn't seem to fit. And uh, two, we don't have time here, but if you read 36, Ezekiel 36 and 37, which talks about the ingathering of Israel, it... Uh, and the resurrection of Israel also. It talks about the whole house of Israel. And it talks about, you know, a people that are spiritually cleansed and uh, people that are obeying God's laws and all that. So that's worth reading and looking at all that. And we, we certainly don't see the whole house of Israel now in, in modern 
uh, Israel. In fact, we don't even see the whole house of Judah. It's, it's part of Judah. There's probably as many Jews lives in America. Well, not quite, but almost as there, do, as there is in modern Israel. So that really doesn't seem to fit uh, that the stage is set for Gog and Magog. But we need a, a timeline to, you know, a more definite timeline than that. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 20. Okay, in, in uh, chapter 20, it's, in my Bible it's captioned the thousand years. So Christ has returned to the earth. He's <clears throat> here to reestablish his kingdom. And uh, in verse 1, one of the first things he does, one, one of the first, is to restrain Satan. And chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. So Satan is bound for a thousand years. <clears throat> Let's go down to verse 7 and see what, what he does when he's released. Verse 7, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive, the, <coughs> to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog of all things. <coughs> so now we might see where they get this evil, evil thought to go out and uh, attack God's nation. He, uh, to deceive them, to gather them for battle. The, uh, verse 9, they marched across the breadth of the earth and then surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So I think we see here that the Gog-Magog prophecy is not for the immediate future. It's for the distant future, at least a thousand years in the future. It'll be near the end of, of the thousand-year reign of God. But still, we have to think that the events are, there are events to happen in the near future, and the table is probably definitely set for that. And just in this last scripture, let's go to um, Joel, third chapter. Joel chapter 3, <clears throat> and I think we'll see here uh, what modern Israel is today and what, what's the time setting for that. Verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1, In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, and here we don't see Israel, not the house of Israel mentioned, it's Judah and Jerusalem, when I restore their fortunes, I will gather all nations, and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. Of course, the Jews are part of Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine and, that they might drink. And if you read this chapter and also uh, Zechariah 12, you'll see more of these same events and I think that's what uh, things are set for now you have Judah there just like a remnant of Judah was uh, brought back before Christ came they built the temple and they prepared the way for for Christ to come now we have Judah again established in the land to set the table for many things rebuilding the temple the beast power to, to come against against them and to uh, try to establish itself as God. And of course it addresses that when he brings all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat to enter into judgment against them. So I think we can see there that kind of the proper relationship now that Gog and Magog is for a much later time 
and uh, what's set now is a, a different kind of uh, fulfillment. And I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. The title is Spir Sinful Strongholds. Sinful Strongholds. Now, what is a stronghold? It's a wrong way of thinking. You might call it a sinful way, perverted way, misguided way of thinking. Um, and it sets up a stronghold in your mind regarding certain things. Other sins you can easily just walk away from once you realize they're wrong or, or fairly easily walk away from them. But strongholds, they're hard to vanquish. It's like a fortress, you know, with all the big walls and cannons and towers. and uh, You throw stuff against it, but it hangs in there. It hangs on you. It's like an evil fortress of the mind. Now Moses told Israel that they had to choose. Um, um, and I'll read Exodus 30:19, kind of build up to all the things he taught them. And then he said, Exodus 30:19, "I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I've set before you life, death and blessing, but also and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. You know, live abundantly. And he elaborated. Well, most of us at baptism, we made the choice to go God's way. We want to choose blessing. We know God's ways are best. Kind of with your mind, you know that God's ways are the best. However, there maybe is one area of your life where the fortress of evil hangs in there. It's a sin that you can't easily kick. And if we find that we have a stronghold, the message is do not concede. Do not concede. I give up trying to overcome this. I just can't do it. Do not concede. Keep at it. Keep at it. Even Paul probably had one. I'm going to read Romans 7. And, and I think you'll agree that probably even the great apostle Paul, now it's probably minor compared to our hangups, but even Paul probably had a, a a stronghold of sin or fortress of sin. Romans 7, verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. In other words, he wanted to do the right thing and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now, this is Paul talking about himself. And I think you haven't really grown spiritually until you're able to say something like that. Oh, wretched man that I am. When you get to the point where you can actually say that about yourself, then I think you're really starting to get there. In other words, you've got to see the fortress of evil. You've got to recognize it. A lot of people have a fortress of evil. They don't see it. They don't want to see it. They have no idea. You've got to see it. It's like you know, you've got to target the enemy and see what it is. Um, Maybe everybody doesn't have a fortune. I guess I can't say everybody, but probably a lot more people than think they do have some way of thinking that isn't godly. As he said, oh, wretched man that I am, verse 24, who will deliver me from this body of evil? And then he goes on and thanks God. And in Romans 8.1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God has a lot of mercy, and I believe if you keep fighting your stronghold and keep resisting, God's mercy will be there for you and you will eventually win. Don't concede. Don't just give up trying. And it worked for Paul uh, and it will work for us as well. Now, I'm going to go back to 2 Kings to Josiah. We talked about that on the podcast last night about Josiah. It's a great story. Josiah was the the last good king of Judah, and uh, 2 Kings 22. And what he did was, after several generations of pagan kings who really turned to the, the evil side, he decided to go back to the true God of Israel, you know, like, like his ancestor David. And at some point, they raised money and they cleaned up the temple and from all the pagan abuse and all kind of pagan stuff was there. And they found a copy of the Bible, the first five books, which is the main part of the Bible that existed at that point. And when they read it, he was shocked what was in it. 
which means they had lost Bible knowledge. And we, what we speculated was that probably the pagans destroyed all the copies of the Bible they could get. And they probably would have destroyed that master copy of the temple, but some enterprising priest probably hid it, so they didn't get to it. And God, of course, didn't will for it to be destroyed, obviously. Um, and then when he read it, verse 22, 19, um, here's what, through the prophetess, Huldah, she was the only one that God would talk with, um, the prophetess Huldah in those days, sent him this message. Verse 19, because your heart was tender, meaning Josiah, and you humble yourself before the eternal when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. You tore your clothes. You wept before me. I've heard you, says the Lord. And God told them they would have peace and he would be able to hold back the forces of evil as long as he was alive. And that was the case. He was very humble. And going to verse 20, chapter 23, uh, verse 24, he did something about it. He at least started to work on, on uh, Judah's fortress of evil. Uh, chapter 23, verse 24. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted with mediums and spiritists, uh, household gods, idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem. He actually went up into Samaria, the northern ten tribes, what was left of them, and destroyed all the idols up there, um, either executed or chased out of the country all of the evil priests of the dark uh, cult, uh, got rid of them all. So he actually got in there and really cleaned up the place. And they even had phallic symbols from Astarte and the temple, all kinds of garbage. He cleaned it all out um, like we should try to clean out our mind, you know, work at it at least. All the abomination that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul. Actually, when you finish reading the whole section, he, they, they had a special Passover to dedicate, rededicate the temple and the people to God. And it says in the Bible there was no king like him. It was the greatest Passover, I, at least the way it's written in Israel's history. This man did great things. Um, anyway, going back to verse 25, who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. He was the last great and good king of Judah. Um, he set a great example for us. And I think one of the things that we all need to do in fighting any fortress of sin that's still left in our thinking, you know, this bad thinking, is to repent with all our heart. Tell God you're sorry for what you are or what you've become or however you want to word it and ask for his help. And turn in the opposite direction, just like he turned the nation in the opposite direction. Uh, they had a great Passover. They read all the Bible to the people, and you know they had, you know, a great. Well, they feasted on lamb and all that stuff you can read about, but they feasted also on the Word of God. They read the Bible. So I tell people go to services, get deeply immersed in learning about God, the Bible, repent with all our hearts, just like He did. Uh, and I want to now. I got this example from a man on the internet. So it's not my story, but I want to use it anyway. This particular man, so he lived out in the country, and they had a deck in the backyard, and some skunks moved in underneath the deck, lived underneath, and, and I guess, and, and one day they went under there, I guess, try to get rid of a skunk, and this skunk sprayed him and his wife big time. They had to actually burn some clothes and purses and other stuff. The, the skunk really got them good. So, they said, well, let's leave these skunks alone and kind of stay away from them. Um, but something happened. He said, it's unbelievable. He says, you can get used to almost any foul smell. Over a period of time, they got used to the way the skunks made their deck smell and their house smell. They just, he said, it's amazing. The problem was when they had visitors. They say, what in the world? Your house is... <laughs> 
And they were embarrassed. And they started getting in their clothes and stuff. And so one day they realized, we just can't allow these skunks to get. So he got really tough. Yeah, actually he got a shotgun. <laughs> and actually killed them all, chased them out, and eventually with enough shot, I guess you kill enough of them, they get the message, and they left. And, they had, and then they had to de-skunkify the place. But the point of that story is, he says, you can get comfortable with bad ways of thinking, with sin. You kind of accept it. Like, they accept it. As long as they got in the house, it wasn't as bad as out on the deck. They got used to this sort of halfway smell of skunk in the house. But other people, you know, it's, it's a real problem for them. You know, get in your clothes, kind of imagine what it's like. Uh, it's like, I have not actually seen anything like it, but I have seen people really, really, really super heavy smokers. And they got in the clothes. And whenever they went places, this, some of you know what I mean, right? But the skunk was even probably 10 times worse than that. And the message is never accept foul thinking. Never accept that fortress of sin that's in your mind. Here are some fortresses, but everybody's going to be unique. Things like pride, lust. You love evil gossip, slicing and dicing people. Envy, all kinds of addictions. Um, we're a world full of all kinds of things. Whatever you find, and there it is, your fortress of evil decide to lay siege, and you're, go you're not going to accept it. You're going to keep fighting it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, where Paul talks about this kind of thing. And 2 Corinthians, we're going to look at verse 2 and 3. 2 Corinthians 2 and 3. Paul says, For if I make you sorrowful, then <clears throat> who then who makes me glad but the one who's made sorrowful by me? I wrote these very things to you. It was Paul was tough, and it's probably, we don't have all his letters, but apparently he wrote two letters to the Corinthians before this one. Um, we only have one preserved. Um, I wrote these very things to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those whom I ought not to have, ought to have joy, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. And I think, um, oh, I got the wrong verse. I mean, I did want to emphasize the word joy, but that's not the verse I want to emphasize. It's 2 Corinthians 10. I did want to emphasize the joy, but this is what I really want to emphasize. Um, and joy is part of hope and being positive. I like the song we sing, but 2 Corinthians 10, verse 2. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with, with you that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think as if I walked according to the flesh. In other words, Paul is saying those people who oppose my apostolic authority and my leadership of the church, they think of me as just like any other human leader doing all the human leadership kinds of stuff, you know, human leadership politics. Paul says no. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war or battle according to the flesh. Notice Paul is saying he's using spiritual weapons, and it's a spiritual battle. We have to see our battle as a spiritual battle. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, we have to use spiritual weapons to pull down strongholds to win the battle of our mind by focusing on spiritual things don't focus on the the negative things in the context in which i mean it uh, don't focus on those evil sinful thought patterns kind of focus on the positive things so they're kind of swept aside um, i want to tell you this this story is called 10 inches a boy was sitting in a park bench praising god he didn't care who heard him openly in the park. And a man who had just finished a particular uh, course at the university came up um, to the young man. And uh, he said, you know, I think I'm going to enlighten you, young man. Um, I'm going to enlighten you to the, the realities of Bible miracles, because I just took this course at the university. Um, 
And the boy says, well, I'm praising God for leading the Israelites through the Red Sea from slavery to freedom. It was spectacular, parting the waters. Um, and the, the man who had, had the university course says, well, I want to enlighten you to the realities of Bible miracles. He says, I took a course, and most of the Bible scholars now believe that at the edges of the Red Sea, it's only like 10 inches deep. What, what they actually went through, they waded through 10 inches of water to get across the Red Sea. See, you don't have to believe in Bible miracles. Well, the boy was stumped. He was stunned. But then after a minute or two, he started praising God again. The guy says, now what? And the boy says, well, think about it. What, that's an even greater miracle. God destroyed the army of Egypt with his horses and only 10 inches of water. Only 10 inches of water, he destroyed the armies of Egypt. Well, I usually try to make a point of those stories. I'm not sure what point I can make out of that one. <laughs> to be honest, I just like the story. But maybe what it proves is that worldly people, worldly wisdom, they don't really understand the Bible. But we can. And God's word can help us to be more positive, have more hope in God, even hope that God will help us overcome our strongholds, our fortresses of sin. Let's go to Philippians 4. And in Philippians 4, we'll go to verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't be worried. Uh, or like, oh, the end of the world's coming. Everything bad's going to happen. Bad things going to happen to me. I'm worried about this, worried about that. Really, that's what that word really means in a more modern translation. Um, that's what he's saying. Um, be anxious or worried for nothing. Don't let things worry you. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Kind of emphasize thankfulness in our prayers, almost as if saying, God, I know you're going to answer this prayer sooner or later. Even before I get the answer, you're that thankful and positive. Um, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We want God's peace to guard our minds and our hearts. God can do that with full joy and hope. You know, hope is one of the big, the great three, as we mentioned, hope, faith, and love. The greatest is love, but all of them are important. Um, and try to ignore the fortress of evil and just say, I'm going to do the right thing, regardless of my bad thinking of the last 50 years or so. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. So Paul's recommendation was try to get hope and positive things in our lives. Try to read positive books, and, if possible. You know, it's getting harder to do positive TV and positive music. You know, and some music is really very destructive. But as much as you can, get positive things in our lives and think about it. Realize that in not too many years, however it works out, Good will win out, Christ will be back, and the world will be a paradise. Not too many years. You know, I'm not setting dates, but it's, you know, it can't be too far out there. Um, by the way, uh, two of the great powers in the world are going to build nuclear power plants in the ocean. So it won't be on their land. So if something goes wrong, the thing just sinks. And I thought about that. I thought, well, what if you get a big earthquake under the ocean and the thing sinks and leaks. They could poison a large percentage of the ocean. I mean, theoretically, right? I don't know if that will happen. And you know, and you think about the book of Revelation, and you see a lot of the bad stuff man's going to bring on himself. God's going to have to come back and save the world from mankind. But God's going to do it. It's coming. And just know it and believe it. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3. Ephesians 2, 1. <clears throat> and you 
he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, <clears throat> in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So who is the prince of the power of the air? It's the devil. So don't be surprised if the media and all the stuff broadcast pushes in a negative, sinful direction. It's, at least until Christ gets back, don't be surprised. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So this is Satan's world, and he's got things going his way, and it's going to get more so as time goes on before Christ comes back. <clears throat> Among whom also we all were once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That means children who are doing things that are going to cause them destruction, pain, and hurt, just as the others. And so we need to realize that <clears throat> we need to walk away from the world, and as much as you can, and it's hard, from a lot of worldly influences. Walk away from worldly influences because uh, they're going to be bad for us uh, and try to focus more on positive, biblical, godly influences. Um, Second John 2 says the same thing with a little more um, emphasis on it. And um, Second John 2, we'll go to verse 15. Oops, I missed it. I meant 1 John 2.15. Because um, there is no 2 John 2. 1 John 2.15. Yes. My transmission is slipping. I'm getting younger all the time. Um, 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not him, in him. For all that is in the world, and that means a lot of things, this world as a whole, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You've got to fight pride. Some, some people, something as simple as just being too proud to really repent holds them back. you just got to fight the pride. Uh, and even if you're very gifted, talented person. That's not that impressive to God, so he gives the gift, so you still have to fight the pride, even if you're gifted and talented. Um, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away, and the lust of it, and who does the will of God abides forever. Think about talents and gifts God gave them to you, it's nothing you need to take credit for, so don't let the pride get to you or the vanity get to you. Um, but all the strongholds like pride, lust, vanity, envy, and a whole host of addictions, um, you know, you probably heard the story of the guy that took just one hit of meth at a party. He was hooked and it ruined his whole life. And I've read stories, just one. Didn't even do it for weeks and weeks. And just like that, his... Here's what they think is true. We all have different genes and, and different brain chemistry. Some people are more vulnerable than some things than others. And some people are really very vulnerable to some things. Uh, God understands it and knows it, and he has the grace for you. You just need to say, well, okay, if this is the particular thing that I'm vulnerable for, dig in there and say, I am not going to concede. I'm going to win. Let's go to Romans uh, 8, 12. Um, this is my last scripture, and I want to make a point. I, I hope I can make this point. Thinking about Winston Churchill and his talking to the British people during the dark days of World War II, which he said was Britain's finest hour. Uh, Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And I think he means not that everybody dies. He means you won't have eternal life. And everybody's going to die eventually. He means you won't have eternal life. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And he means live eternally forever in God's family. So I want to make a point. We have to win 
over our fortress of evil, over our spiritual, uh, from the negative standpoint, the evil strongholds. We have to win. As Churchill told the British people, when they were being bombed, he says, never, ever, never, ever give in. Never concede to your strongholds. It may take you years. Never concede. Never give in. Uh, the stronghold of sin wants to be an active part of your life. Don't let it. Keep fighting. God is very merciful. Somehow, with his help, you'll get through. We will win in the end. Never, ever, ever give in to a fortress of sin.